This past weekend, we celebrated President's Day, which is observed on the third Monday in February. It's a day set aside to commemorate the birthdays of President George Washington and President Abraham Lincoln. Of course, George Washington, first American president, commander of the Continental Army, president of the Constitutional Convention, he was also a farmer. Abraham Lincoln successfully waged a political struggle and civil war that preserved the Union, ended slavery, and created the possibility of civil and social freedoms for all African Americans. And in a few more months, we will celebrate the 4th of July. It'll be the 248th year since our forefathers signed the Declaration of Independence. And for a document, its title, Declaration of Independence, it's pretty self-explanatory, right? Declaration means a formal or explicit statement, announcement. Independence means free from outside control, not depending on another's authority. And by signing the Declaration, those 13 colonies announced their independence from England. Along with the Declaration of Independence affirms the certain truths that they say are self-evident, namely, that we are all created equal and that we are endowed by our Creator with certain inalienable rights. And those rights are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So, for 248 years, Americans have lit fireworks and consumed hot dogs on the 4th of July to celebrate those rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We've been reading the book of Romans for a few months, and I promise we will finish in time for Easter, but I noticed that even in Romans, Paul expresses his own declaration. For instance, Paul makes a case for life. He says, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Even though the capital city of Rome is immoral and living under a corrupt dictator, Paul said that life is possible for all who believe. Paul also argues for liberty. Romans 6, be thanks be to God that you who are once slaves of sin have now become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. 8.21 says that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Through our new life in Jesus, the Christian has their own life and liberty. So when I think about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, I think the words life and liberty are a pretty good summary of what we look We've looked at here in scripture so far. So what about the third one? What about the pursuit of happiness? This is where I think Romans would take a turn from our Declaration of Independence. You see, it's not the pursuit of happiness that is to characterize the believer in Jesus, but rather the pursuit of love. For several weeks now, Romans has been showing us how the good news of Jesus has been love love for one another, love for our enemies, and as we even saw, love for our government. Today we're going to look at a couple different ways we can live our liberty and pursue love as we look at Romans chapter 14. Verse 13 says, therefore let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. I know and am persuaded in the Lord that nothing is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it is unclean. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love by what you do. Do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. First thing we notice, Paul asks that we pursue unity and not division. Here Paul gives an example of eating certain types of food. One Christian believes it's okay to eat bacon, and the other Christian is wrong. <laughs> but this example does not have to be limited to just food. There are lots of things that Christians have opinions about. That's why we have so many different denominations, 33,000 at last count. Now, granted, most of those denominations have fewer than 100 members, but it illustrates my point. The issue back in Rome was over kosher food, 
and holidays. Should Christians only eat food that's defined by the Old Testament, like the laws of Moses? Should Christians continue to observe the Jewish Sabbath, Jewish Passover? And it's completely understandable. Some Christians who were Jewish couldn't imagine worship unless they followed those practices. So their spiritual liberty was narrow because it excluded things that were perfectly fine to do. They were free to do. However, the Greek Christians in Rome had no problem eating all kinds of food, worshiping on any day of the week, and they felt no need to celebrate Passover or any other Jewish holiday. So there is tension about liberty and what we are free to do. Our men's Bible study has been discussing sin for a couple of weeks, and the question came up, was drinking alcohol a sin? And I'm sure you know some Christians that do not drink at all. My wife has a tattoo on her ankle, and there are some Christians who believe that it is sinful. You know, Leviticus 19 says, do not cut your bodies for the dead or put tattoo marks on yourselves. Some Christians don't swear. Ephesians 4 says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. And so what happens? You're out, you know, for brunch with your believer friends, and you notice a woman who you thought was a fine, upstanding person of God, and she has a a tattoo. And she orders a mimosa for breakfast. (gasps) And, And she's looking for her phone in her purse, and she mutters an expletive that makes your toes curl. That's got to be way worse than eating bacon, right? Not to a Jewish person. The Jewish people believed breaking the food laws and the Sabbath laws violated their vow to God. No different than you violating the sanctity of marriage. So when the Jewish Christians saw Greek Christians eating non-kosher food and not observing Sabbath and festivals, they would gasp in horror because in their mind, that meant unfaithfulness to God. But look at how Paul begins this chapter. As for the one who was weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. Paul calls some of the church of Rome strong in their faith, and others weak in their faith in this area of food and holidays. Now, does that mean that the strong in faith are better Christians? More Christians? More saved? No. Look at how he finishes the thought in verse 2. One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. All it means is, some people have certain convictions, and other people don't. Are are these heaven or hell convictions that save us or condemn us? No, Paul is not talking about doctrine or issues of morality, just differences of opinion and how to best apply a biblical teaching. And notice Paul doesn't argue and say one is right and one is wrong. And he doesn't try to tell one group that they needed to change. He is arguing here that these two groups pursue love rather than their own personal happiness. Let's read another section, the one we read before. Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. I know I am persuaded in the Lord, Jesus, that nothing is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it is unclean. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. By what you do, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. When Paul says not to pass judgment, on one another, he's talking about people who drink alcohol and people who don't. He's talking about people who have tattoos and people who don't. But also notice the rest of the paragraph. He takes it even further than just judgment. He also says not to put a stumbling block or a hindrance in another Christian's path. 
In verse 15, he talks about the weak in faith as being grieved because of the behavior of the strong in faith. And that when the strong in faith parade their liberty, they are at risk of destroying their Christian friend. Why does he say this? Because there is a relationship at stake. Again, I think Paul is repeating something that Jesus taught. Jesus says in uh, Matthew 15, hear and understand, it is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth that defiles a person. So Paul is saying that all Christians need to agree or it'll destroy one another. No, because to be honest, I don't think you'll ever get two Christians in the same room to agree on all the same issues. But what Paul is saying is we still need to get along. Look at what Paul writes to the church in Ephesus. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, there is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. What is unity? Does it mean you agree with everyone in your church on everything? Does it mean that you guys all love pizza? You guys all hate pickles? You all watch the same TV shows? You all root for the same uh, college teams? You all like the same music? Of course not. We're all different. And that's great. So what does it mean to be unified with people who are at the same time different than you? Unity in the church is about coming together to form something bigger. It's recognizing that we're stronger together than we are individually. And it's enjoying the fellowship of each other. And unity in the church doesn't happen overnight. As with any relationship, you have to work at it. This is why Ephesians says, make every, what? Effort. Make every effort. Divisiveness is easy. Unity takes effort. Even though we may disagree on all sorts of things, the key to church unity is being on the same page when it comes to the main thing. Something we all learned at the very beginning of Romans, and that is, you have been changed by the truth of the gospel. Each one of us is a sinner. Each one of us is adopted into the same spiritual family. We all share a common identity in Jesus Christ. Paul says the same thing to the church in Corinth. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. Unity is very important. It is an ingredient that we need for progress and, and movement and accomplishment and making strides in all areas of life. There's no team that can succeed without unity. There's no progress that you can make without unity. And if you don't believe Paul, believe Jesus. The night he was betrayed, Jesus prayed in the garden, according to John 17, Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. What did Jesus pray for? Your unity. Now, it's all over our passage today. Something I want you to look at, uh, not only here, but whenever you're at home reading your own Bible, Paul uses the word brothers to describe us. In fact, he uses it 130 times in his writing. And, and it's the Greek word adelphos, which technically means two people that share the womb together. And at 130 times, I think it's pretty safe to say that brothers is one of Paul's favorite words. I think it was Paul's way of saying that we are part of the same family. Families are supposed to work together as one unit, caring for love for one another, not dividing, not devouring one another. What Paul is telling us here is to contribute to people's spiritual growth rather than tearing it down. If we're really going to pursue love, as verse 15 tells us to do, 
and we'll think about how our liberty will affect other people's spiritual growth. When we use our liberty to tear down people's spiritual growth, we're no longer using our liberty to pursue love. Moving on. Verse 16. So do not let what regard as good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. Second, we should pursue the kingdom and not the personal. Pursue the kingdom and not the personal. Look at uh, verses 16 through 18, that, re- that phrase, what you regard as good, what you regard as good, refers to the freedom enjoyed by the Greeks. For the church in Rome, what they consider good is the fact that all foods are clean, every day is sacred in the eyes of God, the path of God's grace is a broad path and lots of freedom, and there's not a lot of restrictive rules and regulations. But what is the kingdom of God? Is it what you eat and drink? Is it what day you worship on? Is it how you educate your kids? Is it whatever side of the political argument that you take? Or is it Jesus? Righteousness. As Paul says, peace, joy, and the Holy Spirit. I mean, let's be real for a moment. Lately, the issues that we are having in America are because of our personal pursuit of happiness. And it's begun to infringe upon the rights of others and their lives and liberty. And I think this is because when we read the Declaration, we assume, oh, look, it says right here, I have the right to be happy. I have the right to chase after things that make me happy. That's got to be what pursuit of happiness means. And so happiness then becomes about preference and pleasure. But what ends up happening is that by chasing after our own happiness, we trample on the happiness of others. So that can't be what the Declaration is saying. I don't believe that when the writers of the Declaration sat down to write this, they meant to imply, just do whatever feels right. Or, if it makes you happy, do it. The pursuit of happiness is listed as a inalienable right. In other words, it's a thing that you already are. And it's listed as a thing the government ensures for all, not some. So if happiness is equal to life and liberty, as the Declaration seems to imply, then we are not dealing with momentary pleasure or, or personal preference of, of an individual or, or, or of a group, which means the pursuit of happiness is not about my happiness. It's about the happiness of all citizens. And Paul makes the same point in Romans. Paul says, it's not about eating or drinking. That would be our personal beliefs, right? Our happiness. Instead, he says, no, it's about righteousness. What is righteousness? Well, that's being right with God. That's what God's kingdom is all about. Helping people be right with God, living in unity with each other, and experiencing the joy that comes from having the Holy Spirit among us. When we pursue the kingdom, our service to Jesus is pleasing to God. And it's vindicated in the sight of people, even people who disagree with us. God's kingdom isn't about what you eat or drink. And it's not about what day of the week you celebrate. It's about righteousness and joy and peace in the Holy Spirit. And before a disagreement breaks out, before we all raise our hand and say, well, I think we should do it this way, we should consider why we are doing it. Is it to pursue the kingdom or to pursue the personal? And then he says in verse 19, so then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Do not, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean, but it is wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. It is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. Does peace just happen? 
Is peace just natural? Does it just click and everything just falls into place? No, Paul says, pursue it. If you sit around waiting for peace to happen in a relationship, you're fooling yourself. Peace is the result of a passionate commitment to pursue it. He says we should pursue community and not destruction. Pursue community and not destruction. Now the ESV that we're reading out of adds something besides peace. It says mutual upbuilding. Don't you like that? It's clear as mud, right? (laughs) Now, some translations say edification, which I like that better. You could also say fortify. The Greek word is a construction term, and it's used to describe the process of making a building stronger. Earlier in the same chapter, Paul says, "By, by what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. Instead, Paul says, pursue peace and mutual upbuilding. In other words, our actions should strengthen the church. Now, I don't know if you know this, but we are living in a self-serving, self-centered, self-obsessed, modern-day rush-rush society filled with negativity and the constant tearing down of others. Between social media bullying and political shouting, our culture is easily offended, and willing to demolish anyone who disagrees with you. But if the church is supposed to be holy and set apart, called out, not like the rest of the world, then we need to be people-orientated and to focus on building others up. Christians should always be in the habit of pursuing community and not destruction. Some congregations forget that. Sometimes churches believe their total purpose in life is to show up to the building for church and to worship and to let the pastor and the elders and the singers, they do all the stuff and, and, and they smile and they sing and they pray, they listen to the sermon and then they go home. And at the end of the day, they don't need each other. They just need the folks up front to do church. But Paul tells the church in Corinth, no, that's not the way it works. So think about this for a moment. How would you fortify your own body? How would you pursue mutual upbuilding for your own physical body? I mean, you'd feed it, right? Sometimes you feed it pretty well. You clean it, showers, bathing, shaving, etc. If you're sick, you're gonna go to the doctor. If your teeth hurt, you're gonna go to the dentist. If it's cold outside, you're gonna put clothes on your body. And most of the time, you're gonna put clothes on your body that make you feel good, look good. Once in a while, you might even pamper yourself, entertain yourself. Those are just some of the ways that you and I nourish and cherish our mortal bodies. But now God is saying, you are also a part of a spiritual body. And he's asking you personally to take care of that spiritual body. How do you do that? How do you nourish and cherish Christ's body? Well, first we have to recognize that we're part of it. We are part of it. And God wants us to participate in it. My dad used to have a bunch of uh, Peanuts cartoon strips uh, in books that he kept in the garage. And one of those old uh, cartoon strips, uh, Snoopy Snoopy broke his leg and he had a cast. And believe it or not, uh, fans from all over the world sent Snoopy get well cards. And in one of those strips, Snoopy is sitting on his doghouse and his leg's in a cast. And he says, my body blames my foot for not being able to go places. And my foot says that it was my head's fault. And my head blame my eyes. My eyes say my feet are clumsy. And my right foot says not to blame him for what my left foot did. And then Snoopy looks at the audience and says, I didn't say anything because I don't want to get involved. It's ironic, right? Because Snoopy is involved. It's his foot and his head and his eyes and his feet. He's already involved because it's his body. And we're part 
of the body of Christ. And God wants you to be involved. We need to build community. Well, what can you do to involve yourself with the body? Some of the stuff we already do, right? We pray for each other. We try to make each other feel welcome. We try to take care of each other's needs. There are people who regularly call those who are home or who are sick. There's people who send out encouraging cards. There's especially important uh, people in the world that do this. I think, you know, call, call people. If you look around and you notice your friends are missing, call them. Email them. Contact each other on Facebook. Send cards. Contact one another and say, how are you doing? Pray for one another. We need each other. And, and even more than that, I need you. Okay? I, I don't know if you realize this, but I make mistakes. I fail all the time. Every preacher worries that they're going to miss something or forget to call someone or not contact a person who needs to hear from them. And, and I'm just as prone to fail as the next person. I need you to contact me if you think I need to contact someone or pray for someone. W without you, I, I miss people I don't want to miss. That doesn't mean you shouldn't be doing the same thing, calling, contacting, praying, but it just means we work together. We work together to build community. If we go back to Ephesians, it says the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, it makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. There's that phrase again, right? Mutual upbuilding, edifying, fortifying. Together, we build the body of Christ. Together, we build community, life, liberty, and the pursuit of love. That's what God has called us to do as a church. That is what God has called us to do each and every week together. We can all do our part. When each piece is working properly, we can make the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for the book of Romans, and we thank you for the words that continue to speak to us, speak to our hearts. Lord, we would just ask that you would continue to help our church grow in community and grow in love. That we would genuinely show concern for the person sitting next to us, genuinely show concern for the person in front of us, learn names, shake hands, hug, know each other, be a part of each other's lives and do community together to help one another as we help this community to put you first in all things and to remember to be unified, not in every way, but in you, to love you, to be filled with your Holy Spirit and to pursue peace and unity and joy. We thank you for every good thing. In Christ's name, amen. Hey, in just a couple of weeks, it's going to be Easter. It is. It's going to be Easter. And we always have three different Easter experiences for you. The first one is at 7 o'clock, and it's at the Yacht Club flagpole. Now, we'll have chairs for you. Some people like to bring their own lawn chairs. Uh, it's just a fun opportunity to celebrate Easter and to watch the sunrise over the lake. It's beautiful. Uh, then we'll have two services here in the sanctuary. One's at 9 o'clock and one's at 11 o'clock, and they're both completely identical, and we want to have childcare for uh, both services. So please uh, come, bring your kids, be a part of our Easter celebration, and if you have any questions, you can always refer to our website, or you can give us a call during the week. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks, guys. I'll see you next time. Bye.